Hi weaving friends, I bet a lot of you already have seen or know about these pot holder looms that were so popular back in the 70s. So many people tell me that they used to do these at school or with their mum or with their grandmother, which is really nice to have that memory. The thing that I like about this type of loom is that it makes weaving more accessible for some people. And I'm all about weaving accessibility because I know how expensive it can be to get into this weaving game. And it doesn't need to be if you wanna start out with the basics, try a little bit of weaving, see what you can do on basic equipment, and then maybe make a decision from there whether you wanna go on to further types of weaving or whether you're just happy to stick with the basics. Either way is fantastic, I think. So, my husband and I collaborated on this little project. I love working on weaving projects with my husband because he is good at building things and working things out and I'm good at telling him exactly what I want him to do and he just enjoys working on these projects anyway so it's a win-win situation. So what we're going to do in today's video is I'm going to talk just a little bit about the construction of this loom but the main information for the loom will be over on my blog and there'll be a link for that directly underneath this video please do click on more or show more if you can't see it and then you'll get a drop down menu and the link will be there the reason for that is i can put all the information all the measurements and everything that you need to actually make this loom for yourself in a PDF file, you can go to my blog, there'll be a button there and you can download it. And it's just really nice and simple. So it's an easy way to do it. You can see here a little bit of footage while I'm chatting away of my husband actually putting this loom together. Yes, the famous man hands are back. It's been a while since you've seen them, but they did a great job putting this together with very basic materials. Now, if you already had some equipment um, sitting around, perhaps you had some wood, doesn't matter if it's secondhand wood, as long as it's suitable to have nails driven into it, then this could be almost a free project for you to do. As it was for us, we didn't really have any suitable wood sitting around. Um, so my husband bought some, but it didn't take a very long piece. This whole loom was put together for under $15, which is a very good deal, especially these days. Now, one thing my husband did want me to let you know is if you go over to the blog and you get the measurements because you want to make a loom for yourself, you don't have to cut the pieces of wood yourself like he did. Because you have the dimensions beforehand, if you go to the hardware store, most hardware stores, if they're any sort of decent hardware store, will actually cut the lengths of wood to your specifications. All you need to do is give them the measurements. They do it, they've got all the equipment there and takes that part of it out for you um, if you're concerned about cutting straight with hand tools and so on as my husband did. So then after the pieces of wood are put together, as you can see, it's just a basic frame and this one works out to a seven inch frame. The actual weaving that you can do on the frame, just like with any weaving loom, it's going to be smaller than the size of the loom. So when I'm talking about seven inches, I'm talking about the measurements of the loom. What's gonna be on the inside is, well, it's already on the inside of the loom, but in addition to that, we have draw in, of course. So the actual loom piece that you take off doesn't work out to be seven inches. Depending on the yarn, it might work out five, five and a half inches square. It does depend, but just so that you know that before you start. Okay, so there are a bunch of different things that you can do with a loom like this. A lot of people do use them to make the classic pot holders. And for that, you can purchase pre-made loops. They're really handy and I would have used them if I had access to them. I can get them here, but I have to order them from the US and it's terribly, terribly expensive. So one thing that I tried, and I'm gonna show you in a moment um, how this turned out, is I tried using t-shirt yarn and I tried sewing my own loops and putting them together. Now, while the sewing part worked, here's a little piece to show you as an example. So I cut them to a certain length. Um, I pinned them together like that. I flattened out the ends first and I sewed them together to make a loop. So when you actually buy the pre-made loops, there's no join. 
and that's the beauty of it that they are seamless so it, it's neat and they're, they're easy to use would love to have access access to them but i'm not going to pay that much for them so that's one way you can use a pot holder loom is with the loops and there are a lot of providers of loops a lot of them make acrylic loops and i i wouldn't be going for those personally for a pot holder i'd want cotton so just bear that in mind if you go shopping online for some loops another way that you can use this loom if you don't have the loops is you can get the t-shirt yarn you can get it on a cone like this or you can make it yourself of course um, oh that's another thing people do make their own loops from say t-shirt sleeves and that kind of thing but us as a family, we tend to wear our clothes until they are absolutely worn out. So I don't generally have t-shirts sitting around that I can cut up. I do have this t-shirt yarn though. This is left over from another project and I have a lot of it. And so one of the tutorials I'm going to be doing with this loom is with the t-shirt yarn to make a pot holder. So that's another option. It's still not as easy as using the loops, but it's an option. And then another thing you can do is you can use wool or cotton or other yarn. Um, I'm, going to be I'm going to be talking about these yarns a bit more once I actually get onto the tutorial. And you can use this as a weaving loom to use those kind of yarns as well to make little squares. Um, usually you would make the squares to be part of something larger. So you would weave a bunch of squares in whatever colors you wanted and then you could seam them together to make all kinds of things, whether it be blankets or runners or basically any larger piece of weaving that you could normally make, you can make by sewing squares together. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a couple of the things that I've already made on this loom. The first one I'm gonna show you is the t-shirt yarn that I tried sewing into loops myself. Now, this turned out okay uh, my tension was really tight and also because of the size of the t-shirt yarn it's quite a bulky yarn this little hot pad turned out very tight the tension was quite tight and it was set very close so it's really dense my main problem with this one though is that some of the seams well a lot of the seams of the loops do show so while it was easier to weave with loops i don't like the end result as much because you can see these little raggy bits i tried to sort of stick those down into the weaving as i was going along but they still show on either side and this side has even more of them because those little seams i guess they have to go somewhere and so they just kind of stick out. So I wasn't a fan of that method for that reason. Another one that I did in t-shirt yarn is this one. And with this one, I experimented a little bit more with leaving some, leaving some of the spaces bare in between the nails to give the yarn a little bit more room because as I said, it was quite tight. And here's another one with the t-shirt yarn. I've just left all my ends pretty raggy at this stage, so don't pay any attention to that. You can definitely make them look neater than that. I just haven't done that. And this one, I actually probably like this one the most. Um, the, but again, it's, it's very dense, which isn't bad, but it gets hard to weave. And um, we'll have a look at that in the second tutorial when we actually use the t-shirt yarn. And then I also made this little square with wool. So this is all wool and I combined different strands of wool to make these patterns, which actually turned out pretty cool. I'll bring that a little closer so that you can see the pattern. So the wool is what we're going to be using in this first tutorial and I've got two wools here the pink one is a DK weight wool and this yellow one it's an Australian five ply which is more like a sport weight like the American sport weight and this one is an Australian eight ply which is a DK weight 
Now there are only a, a, there are only a couple of other things that you will need to weave on a loom like this. You'll need a crochet hook right at the end and the size can vary but a larger one is more helpful because we're going to be using it to take loops off the nails at the end. This one is a 5.75 millimeter or a size 10 which works pretty well. This is a tool that my husband made me to go with the loom. It's quite good what he did. He did have a hard time sort of bending this into shape, um, but he managed it eventually. It's really tough wire. And then he also sanded it so that it was really smooth because it needs to be smooth to work its way through the weaving. So I've got this kind of crooked hook on one end and then a more rounded hook on the other end. And I don't tend to use this one so much. I use this one because it's slightly, see how it's slightly offset? That works really well for working through the nails, but also through the yarn, because you, you get into these tight sort of spaces. So the, the template for this will also be in that PDF that I mentioned. And then it, you just need a pair of scissors, of course. Okay, so I'm gonna take these two yarns and I wanna take a strand of each one and put them together to use them as one yarn. So I've got a very bubblegum pink and quite a mustardy kind of yellow. And to start with, I'm just going to make a slip knot with those two together. It's gonna to keep them together and it's also gonna give me somewhere to secure them to begin with. I secure them just here on the right bottom hand peg and I can just tighten that up. That's going to come off there later. We're going to start putting our warp on and I'm going to keep these two yarns together, but I'm not aiming to go really tightly. I, I do want to keep a kind of a firm tension, but not super tight because I'm going to need room at the end to take these off the pegs. And if, you, if your warp ends up to being really tight at the end, you're gonna have a really hard time taking those loops off. So I'm going around each nail or peg, I think of them as pegs, they're nails. And so at the bottom, I'm looping around and then back up again and then looping around the next empty one and then back down again. And I'm just feeding off the yarn from the balls as I go. You might wonder why am I using two strands together? Uh, it's a twofold purpose. It's for the colors because I, I like the colors together and it gives a cool effect once we start weaving. But also because of the spaces between the nails, how this warp is actually spaced. If I was to use just say a single strand or a thinner yarn or whatever, then I would have the warp really spaced out wider than I want it. And I'd have a square, I'd end up with a square that was kind of see-through and a bit loose in the set and so for this particular spacing of these nails I've found this combination of yarns to be good. I would even put two DK yarns together in a warp like this and that would work out fine I'm sure. So if you take a look at the square that I've done that I've done previously, it's the set I think is just right. Like it's not too loose, it's not too tight. It feels quite soft, it's nice to move around. So like this would be perfect for a blanket if you were going to sew a bunch of squares together. Um, and it's not so it's not so loose that it's going to have poor fabric inten integrity or anything like that. And so this one, the, the weights of yarn that I'm using here are very similar to that one. So it should work out pretty similar.
So we're almost to the other side now. Okay, so if I was going to say I wanted to use a different colored weft, then I could cut this off and slip knot it and just hold it on one of these nails here until I was ready to bind this off. But I'm actually going to use the same colors for the weft. So I'm not going to cut that. I'm just going to loop it around on the left hand peg just so that it's ready to go. This is where my handy tool comes in that my husband made for me. I'm going to start at the bottom and I always like to start with a little bit of plain weave in the very first go. And I'm going to be looking for an entire loop repeat. So to find that, I'm looking at the bottom at the bottom nail, but I'm also looking at the top nail. That loops around and then comes back down. And so that's one loop repeat there, which should be four threads, considering the way that we have warped. We've doubled things. So I'm gonna go over that first lot. Then I'm looking for my next loop repeat, which it's really easiest to see if you look at the top nail. It's pretty clear that this is the next repeat. So because I went over the first one, I'm going to go under that one. The next loop repeat, I'm looking at the top nail and I can see it here. And so I'm going to go over that one. So you see that I'm just going over, under, and that's going to give me the plain weave. Just be careful when you're doing this to not lift up your threads. You, if you lift them up, they are going to pop off the nails. If you're worried about that, you can use something like rubber bands and just pop a rubber band over the top and the bottom and that will hold them in place. I haven't had any threads pop off yet, but say with the t-shirt yarn, which is much thicker and takes up more space, it's more likely to you know, get closer to the top of the nail. So you do wanna be a bit cautious about that. So I'm just continuing to go over and under those four threads using the top row of loops as an indicator to where to go. And then I reach the other side. Okay, so I wanna bring my hook down. I'm going to be grabbing this yarn that I just held here temporarily, which is also my warp yarn, but is now going to become my weft yarn. I want it to loop around this first nail, and then I want it to go into this hook. So I find it easiest to kind of turn the hook upwards, pop my yarn in there, and then start to pull it back through the warp. And you wanna make sure you, that you don't take any warp threads with you. And make sure also that your weft yarn is nice and loose at this end so that you've got room to pull it into the shed. And then I'm gonna pop that with my hook, or you could do it with your fingers if that's easier, over that first nail. So let's have a look now at what I've got. I wanna make sure that weft yarn is staying where it's supposed to stay with that first nail. So now that I've got that row, I can push that down with my fingers I have tried pushing it down with a tool, like a tapestry tool, but I find with this loom, it is actually easier with your fingers. Now with the loops on the end, you don't wanna pull those super tight. So I wouldn't wanna be pulling that really tight because again, I have to get that off that nail at the end. So I'm leaving a little bit of slack there. Not a heap, but just, just so that it's relaxed where it is. Okay, so then I'm ready for the next row. I'm starting from the right again. Now, the last loop, loop group, how do you like that loop group, that we went over, we're now going to go under. And then the next 
we'll go over, then under. So we're doing the same, but the opposite of what we did on the last row, so that we end up with our weft yarn in a different shed this time. So still over under, but where we started over on this side, we now start with under, under, over, under, over. And I'm looking at the top here to see where my, left, my warp loops are so that I have my groups. And then I'm finishing up on top of the last group. Now I wanna get my hook down a little bit closer. I'm just gonna pop it through there so I can see clearly what I'm doing. And then the next lot of weft is going to go around the next nail and then back into the shed. So I'm gonna pop it into the hook and then slowly, if I move the hook to here, uh, um, slowly pull it back into the shed. Now you notice that I'm not around the right nail there, but I'm going to fix that afterwards. That's kind of one of the tricky parts of using the hook is that you don't always have the threads in the right place because the hook can be a little bit tricky to manipulate. And make sure that you don't hook any of your warp threads on the way back. Or if you do, make sure that you unhook them. Okay, so that's gonna go on the second nail or peg and then I'll just go back over here and I can either do this with the hook or with my fingers, whichever is easiest. And I'm just going to lift those wefts up so that they're on the correct peg. So they should be on the second peg there. Yeah. And then we can, you can tighten that up if you need to, but not too tight. Okay, and then push down. Okay, so we'll keep going. Sorry about the lighting change there. I had to change the lighting because I had the sun starting to shine in and that doesn't make for good videography. So next row, let's have a look at the last row we went underneath with the weft. So now we're gonna go over this group and then under the next group. So I just find it really handy to slide my finger in there and just separate the, the warp loops that way. It just is much easier because you've got four threads that you need to isolate. And um, so it's just easy to do it that way. Still doing over under. Okay, so I'm going down. And again, I haven't got my hook in the right spot. I can probably get it there. It's a bit of a squish. There we go. Sometimes it's easier to just let the hook go where it wants to go and then pick up the correct loop later. So then we'll just hook that yarn and we'll start taking it back into the shed, laying the hook on its side. Once you get through the nails and it's got to go under the first lot. And slowly take that back through. You can see why you wouldn't want to have any roughness or snags on your hook when you're doing this. If you can't make a hook or don't have anything suitable, you might find a Tunisian crochet hook might do it for you because they, they're quite a bit longer. They have the hook at the end like a regular crochet hook, but they have a longer stem. Um, and the hook might be slightly more hooked. I'm not sure. Anyway, that's, that could be something to try. And so now I just need to push that down. Okay, so we've done three rows of plain weave. Now I wanna show you 
how to change it up a little bit if you want to. I mean, of course, you can continue on doing plain weave, but it's also fun to do something a little bit different. So what we're going to do with the hook this time, instead of just going um, underneath one, we're going to go underneath two warp groups. Okay, and then we'll go over one. And then we'll go underneath two, over the next one, under two, over one, under two, over one, And we're not changing the way we do anything else except for the interlacement that we're going to create. So instead of just over under, we're changing that up a little bit and then grabbing the weft yarn and going back through. And then I'll pop that on the next nail. And I've got to fix up my weft over here to go around the correct peg because it was going around two and then I can just tighten that up a little bit and then again push down so you can see there the different kind of interlacement that that gives us so we're going to repeat that on the next row but of course we're going to change it a little bit because otherwise we'll just get wefts in the same row over and over so for the last one, we went underneath two and then over one. So for this one, we're going to go over two and underneath one. Over two, underneath one. Over two, underneath one. Over two, underneath one. Over and uh, to the end. And then grab that weft and come back in. I have to go underneath that first group and then through. And then onto the correct hook onto the correct nail. Again, I've got, I'm a bit looped here, looped around three nails instead of one. So I'll just fix that, put it back where it's supposed to be. I can tighten if I need to and press down. So I think that that's a very pretty pattern. So I'm going to continue doing that particular pattern. So this time when I come back, I went over the first two. I'm going to go under the first two and then over one, under two, over one. So I'm repeating the first row that I did from when I changed it up. Grabbing my weft. And then over the next nail. And again, I'm coming back to fix up which nail that should be on right there. As I said, I could really make sure that it's on the right nail initially, but I don't mind coming back to fix it up. I think it's easier than trying to manipulate the hook into the exact same, exact right space. So what I'm gonna do from here is I'm gonna keep weaving in that particular way. And then when I get a little bit closer, what is it, the last three, it'll be the last three nails that I'll need to do the plain weave for again. So I'm going to keep weaving in real time for those of you who want or need that. And for those of you who don't want that, 
you can go ahead and speed up this part of the video um, until I get closer to the top and then show you what to do then. But I know some of you at least would like to watch this in real time. So I'll just keep going and we'll carry on and we can weave the whole square together from start to finish.
right so now I'm getting to very close to the top and I've got three nails left on either side and so I'm going to kick back into that original plain weave that I was doing and so to do that I'll just come back in my last thread on this side I went over so I'm going to start with under and then I'm just picking up the original warp loops four threads in total and doing that one one interlacement of over under over under now as you get towards the top of the loom it does get squashy and so you've got to have a little bit of patience at this point um, it's it gets kind of hard to fit the hook into the space it's still doable you just need to go slowly and be careful not to push your warp loops up Okay, and so the last one went over, uh, the last one went under, so this one I'm going to go over and then under and go through with that interlacement again for our plain weave. That brings us to the last row. And I'm going to go under, over, and just taking a little bit of extra time because I don't have very much space here. don't have to use every nail on the loom either you can skip the end nails um, the top ones if you want to if it's just too hard for you to use this space that's left and that would be fine So I'm just working my way through really slowly, trying not to catch any warp threads. Almost there. Okay. Great. So I can push that one down as well. And now let's have a look at what we've got. Okay, so that last weft tail I'm going to cut that but I'm going to leave a couple of inches a good couple of inches on that and I'm just going to do a very soft knot around the end nail there just to hold that in place temporarily now this is where our crochet hook comes in if we took this off the loom as it is it would just unravel and fall apart so we can use some crochet techniques to bind it off. Now, it doesn't matter which corner you start in, but you're going to pick up one of the loops. So I'm just gonna start at the top right-hand corner. And remember that you're picking up two, two pieces of yarn. Uh, you should see two pieces on top of your crochet hook. And I'm going to just pull that off the hook. And then I'm gonna to go to the very next loop I'm going to grab that loop and bring it through the first ones that I pulled off. It's easiest to kind of grab this with your fingers and do it that way. Pull it through like that and then go to the next loop along, pull that up and then pull that through. Next loop, make sure you grab both of your yarns. And then pull that through and you keep going to the next one pull that off 
and then pull it through. This gives a really nice rounded crocheted edge. Now you can see now why you wouldn't want to go too tight with your warp or your weft yarns because these loops are coming off the nails beautifully but if I had put too much tension on them it'd be really hard to get them off and it'd also be really hard to loop them through each other like this too. So I'm going to make my way around every loop that's on the loom and you'll see that the piece gradually comes off as you go around. Again, I'm going to continue to do this in real time for those of you who need it. But if you want to skip ahead, you can do that too. Okay, I've gotten to a corner so I'm just going to rotate and here this is where I had my little knot so I'm just going to pop that out for a moment. I'm actually going to needle weave that in afterwards. You can sort of start to crochet it in um, along with the ends if you want to. It gets a little bit thick doing it that way. It is doable but I'm, I think it's easier to just needle weave it in at the end. There's only a couple of ends that you need to needle weave in, so it's not a big deal. Another thing that you'll note when you look at the project instructions, the PDF that I'll have for you, the type of nails that we use, uh, I'm not sure what they're called, probably round head nails or something like that, but they don't have the typically really flat head that a lot of nails have. They're smaller at the top. And so we chose those nails specifically so that I could do this, so that I could just pull these loops up and off, without, and off without any hassle. If they were the flatter type, then you might have trouble getting the yarn over the head. It may split the yarn too, I'm not sure. So you can get faster at this as you go along. Okay, turning corners again. And the next loops. Just be careful at this point that you don't start losing loops because the piece does start to, you can see it starts to lift off the loom as you go. Again, you know, I could have some rubber bands over this side or whatever while I'm doing a different side if I was really concerned about it. Um, I could even have a rubber band on the side that I'm working on and move it back one space as I go along. That would definitely keep things in place. You wouldn't have to worry about losing any loops then. Oh, there we go. Those loops just popped off there just as I was talking about it. So I'm being a little bit more careful now. I'm sort of holding these ones down as I go so that they're not lifted off with the one that I'm working on at the moment. Now 
Now on this side I've ended up with pretty big loops um, and that was my fault. I could have warped um, a little bit closer to the nails. Uh, I would do that next time. Okay, so into this loop. You have to be really careful not to lose these loops. Again, I've got a tail here. It's still holding on to that end nail there, which is fine. I'm going to need to weave that one in when I'm done here. Yeah, so my loops are looser on this side because I didn't warp close enough. I just wasn't thinking about it. It still works out. It's just going to look a little bit different to the other sides. Oh, we've got some more loops coming off here. But I'm almost at the end, so I think I can manage. Okay, last loop. So that's now completely off and that's the finished piece. Apart from, I just need to undo this little knot that I've made for myself there. And then I can needle weave those ends in same as over here. Okay, so that is our finished square with a couple of different styles on it. If we have a look at the back, it looks very similar, slightly different just because of the yarn color positioning. I hope that gives you some ideas. Of course, if I was going to use these squares and I wanted to use them to sew together as a blanket or whatever, I would be wet finishing them because they're, they're quite loose directly off the loom. So I'd want to wet finish them, bring that yarn together, make it bloom and then move on to the next step. So the next tutorial will be for pot holders with some t-shirt yarn. So make, sure you, so make sure you stick around for that video if that is interesting to you. If you're interested in finding out more about potholder looms and what you can do on them, I've got some great resources for you. I encourage you to check out these wonderful ladies. The first one is the Crafts Teacher. Annika does a wonderful job of showing all different things you can do with your potholder loom. And the next one is Noreen Crone Finlay. Also, she has a lot of videos for you. And the last one is Margie Duffy, who does some really wonderful patterns. So please check out those ladies. I'm going to leave their links down below as well.